Chased by the deep state, fighting for independence, thinking about revolution, looking for alternative solutions. The enemies of the deep state will tell you what others even don't dare to think. Manuel Oxenreiter and Mateusz Piskorski. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the next edition of the geopolitical podcast, Die Guten Menschen, Public Enemies of the Deep State. My name is Manuel Oxenreiter. I am editor-in-chief of the German news magazine Zuerst. And I am talking to my friend and colleague, Mateusz Piskorski from Poland. Hello, Mateusz. Today we will not talk about Belarus as far as I know, right? Yes, and uh, not about Europe as well, at all. So hello from uh, Poland, but we'll discuss some uh, distant places, uh, distant from Europe at least. Yes, today we will talk about Mali, and in Mali was a coup d'etat, or as we say in Germany, because it is the much more beautiful term for for such a thing, putsch, putsch in Mali. Maybe you can tell in a nutshell what happened in Mali. I mean, isn't uh, in, it's not the first putsch in Mali. That is, I think, now the second or third one. Maybe you can uh, give a little bit info. What about what about is that what happened there? Well, actually, it uh, becomes a kind of tradition in this part of uh, Africa. Uh, every, almost every shift of power. I mean, I have studied the history of uh, contemporary history of Mali after 1960, uh, when it uh, gained independence from France. Uh, and uh, if I'm not wrong, I think that there was only one uh, shift of power, which was not a putsch. So uh, we might we might talk about a certain tradition when it comes to alternation of power in uh, Mali, uh, but uh, of course it concerns not only Mali but uh, much part of the former French uh, Western mm -hmm. Africa. But I have a, I have a very very stupid question because I remember very well in the times. Let me say uh, before uh, the last putsch, which was in 2012, I remember that mainstream media, mainstream politics, especially all those who are somehow active in uh, the political area of development policy, described Mali as a type of role model democracy in Africa. Was that wrong? Well, uh, at least uh, the Malian putsches were not so... And brutal and uh, violent uh, and with so many victims as it w was in uh, another African country. So anyway, uh, to talk about the putsch, well, you, uh, usually you think about uh, a lot of vic lots of victims, about uh, uh, clashes in the streets, about uh, even a kind of uh, civil war. Mm, actually, in Mali, what happened? What happened in Mali on the, on the uh, 18th of uh, August was that a group of uh, officers from a military base in uh, Kati, which is just 15 kilometers from uh, Bamako, from the capital city of Mali, uh, was uh, uh, well gathering there, just talking about uh, the necessity to throw down the acting president. And uh, his group, his political group, and uh, as a result, they have made a decision to come to the capital on, uh, without using any tanks, without using any heavy weapon. They, they just came to the presidential palace. They just came to some governmental buildings with some uh, Toyota pickups and uh, light weapon. Uh, and simply arrested uh, practically the whole government and the president. Yes, so it seems to be quite easy without any, uh, without any uh, excessive force, brutality, and so on. Um, that's and the why president the, is released already. Uh, I was reading. So yes, they, yes, yeah, well, of course. After but the he resigned. They, yes, but he resigned. Yeah. Of course, of course. Okay. Well, that that was the. The, the main reason to arrest him, just to <laughs> persuade him that, that he should resign, yes. Uh, so he has resigned, all the uh, ministers, the whole government has resigned, and now we have a, a group uh, of uh, military men, some call it a junta, traditionally, 
which is uh, practically controlling all the governmental structures of uh, of the country. Uh, it's led by uh, Asimi Goita, a young colonel of uh, Malian army. Uh, the guy is, I think, uh, just uh, 37. So some people think of about, uh, think here about uh, some similarities, let's say, with the um, putsch in Libya in 1969. Gaddafi, yes, young, yes. Young colonel Gaddafi, yes. So, <laughs> but it's both, our uh, our age. It's our age. We have to say also. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So. Yes. <laughs> but the, the the only thing they have in common is probably the age and the fact that um, that they are. Uh, Alto Gaddafi was a little bit younger even, uh, but uh, the fact that they are military and young, uh, relatively young military men, uh, and uh, that they are in the rank of uh, colonel, yes? So, uh, main three guys uh, who are officially organizing this uh, putsch uh, were uh, two colonels, relatively young, before 40, uh, years old, and uh, one general also relatively young. So just a group from one military base, yes, mm -hmm. which took power without any problems. We might say that, uh, well, the power lies somewhere in the streets of uh, Bamako and uh, cities like that, and that it's very easy to take control of such a country. Yeah, they, they they picked they picked it up because what was interesting um, I was then um, not just reading a lot I was watching um, a lot of footage about the day and the days of uh, the putsch and uh, the whole civil life in Bamako and and in other cities in Mali uh, was going on as totally normal um, there was uh, no uprising in the population no dis content there was no protests there was even no not cheering or so it was as if nothing happened and we we uh, just um, mentioned the, the the peaceful transmission of power uh, it, it looked almost like that yes is that was this impression correct or was it totally wrong well Mali had uh, elections this year and parliamentary elections uh, so, uh, I mean, I'll not name the country which has some problems now with, uh, let's say, uh, people who try to organize a color revolution, but uh, just think about some double standards analyzing the situation in Mali and in the country we have discussed yes. about, uh, several times. Yes. So, um, the difference uh, is quite shocking because when it comes to Mali, uh, in spring, they, they had the parliamentary elections. After the elections, of course, uh, mm, the huge opposition movement, uh, social movement, accused the president mm, that he has uh, organized some fraud in the elections because, of course, his party won um, in parliamentary elections as well. Uh, and uh, then there were several months of unrest at the streets of Bamako. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that's why uh, I'm just uh, trying to explain that this is not the, the case that a few few guys from a, a, a military base near near the capital came and and solved everything in uh, within a few hours. Yes, but I'm telling that there was a kind of social ground. Yes, of uh, social protest, quite massive. Uh, going on there since uh, several months. Uh, so that's why the power was on the streets, yes. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, everything was ready and that's why uh, actually the protesters, uh, uh, just after the news came about the arrest of uh, uh, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, the, the former now the former president of, of Mali, mm -hmm. the people were cheering and uh, feasting in the streets, yes, uh, for the very first uh, hours after after they got that news. Because, of course, there was a huge uh, opposition movement there. And uh, what is very interesting, I think, uh, is uh, to analyze the, let's say, ideological background of this opposition. Have you heard about Imam uh, about Imam Mahmoud Diko from Mali. 
No, uh, I know one one um, oppositional politician from Mali, and uh, this is Omar Mariko. That is the only one I I know. I, I met personally, but uh, tell me about uh, about your guy. What uh, what's to know about him? Well, uh, it's quite interesting because some of the mainstream uh, European, Western, and even African media. Uh, talk about him as of a kind of, uh, well, let's say, uh, African Khomeini. Uh, he is, of course, uh, not, a, not a Shia, but a Sunni Muslim. And uh, he's a religious leader there. Uh, he used to support the former, now the former president, Keita, before. Uh, he even ran a, an Islamic council in uh, Mali. He was supporting the idea of negotiations with uh, all those Islamist groups in in Mali. On the other hand, from the purely political, ideological point of view, he's quite interesting for at least two reasons. First, uh, I think he is the only charismatic leader in, uh, in, in the whole country, in Mali. Um, at least... Uh, we know only about about him as a charismatic leader. He was a kind of spiritual but also political leader of all those protests uh, starting after the frauded elections, uh, the parliamentary elections. And uh, f- second, for, the, uh, uh, for some ideological reasons, he might also look quite interesting because, well, on the one hand, he has uh, completed some studies and courses in... Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, so uh, there was a touch of Salafi ideology at a certain moment, at least. On the other hand, he claims that he is, uh, for a, let's say, more moderate, uh, very, very, let's say, a, a original uh, way of uh, Western African Islam, yes? Very tolerant when it comes to pre-Muslim uh, beliefs as well. I mean the traditional traditional religions of, of Mali because uh, uh, when we speak, for instance, about the salt of the country, uh, we have to notice that there are still several groups of people which are into uh, non-Muslim and non-Christian beliefs, I mean the, the traditional beliefs of Africa. He is even a kind of perceived as a kind of a mystic, yes, a traditionalist mm-hmm. mystic which means that uh, he finds, uh, well, <laughs> we could find uh, some uh, similarities to, let's say, René Guénon or Julius mm-hmm. Evola in European thought, yes. But he's talking that in every religion there is a, a hidden a hidden through uh, that you can find a traditionalist way to, to live, to act, and so on. Uh, in every kind of a religion. So he's um, really quite tolerant as for someone who has finished some of his studies in Saudi Arabia and uh, was perceived as a guy who is under the influence of the Salafi movement. Nevertheless, uh, he is uh, very anti-Western when it comes to cultural issues. Uh, he was fighting all the times with this, you know, LGBT propaganda and so on, which mm-hmm. which was also spreading in some African countries. So we might talk about him as a charismatic traditionalist leader of uh, Malian people, yes, of Malian people of different uh, beliefs and different origins. He himself is a member of the Fulani tribe, quite uh, influential there. Nevertheless. Uh, his message uh, is uh, quite effective uh, and spreading among all ethnic groups and all religious groups in Mali. And uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, I would like to stress it once more from a traditionalist point of view because um, it shows us that even in a country which is somehow uh, divided, uh, that has some several different religious groups, uh, one might find a traditionalist key to all those groups. Yes, so yeah. it's a symbol of, of uh, maybe not only Malian, but uh, Western African traditionalism on the one hand. On the other hand, his uh, political message and political program is... Uh, well, uh, vehemently anti-colonial, which means uh, when it comes to Western Africa, for certain historical and geopolitical reasons, his program is 
anti-French, which means that he's criticizing this idea of the uh, Francophonic uh, Union and so on. Yes, And uh, all uh, forms of neocolonialism, which are spreading throughout the former French Africa, like, you know, for instance, that uh, uh, they have to, according to, to, to some agreements between them and France, they have to keep some of their uh, currency and gold reserves in France. In yes, France yes. Huh? Yes. So this is still a form of neocolonialism, of course, yes? Yeah. And, uh, well, uh, uh, Mahmoud Diko he was uh, vehemently criticizing this uh, situation and uh, the whole system of uh, uh, French neocolonialism in uh, uh, Western Africa. Well, after the putsch, uh, he has met uh, with the colonels, with the guys who are behind the putsch, and uh, his uh, spokesman has announced that uh, uh, Mahmoud Diko is, uh, uh, well, resigning from uh, any political activities, which means, which means actually that Mahmoud Diko is supportive for the putsch. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the, 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 the most influential spiritual leader, a traditionally spiritual leader of Mali, actually supported the putsch. And uh, probably his uh, political movement, or at least, I mean, if he withdraws from politics, anyway, he will uh, he will preserve his uh, influence uh, on uh, different political movements and parties, the traditionalist ones there. Uh, so uh, probably anyway, he he got some uh, guarantees from from the colonels, from the military junta, uh, that uh, they will soon convey new elections. Uh, and uh, I guess he got some guarantees that his um, uh, movements and parties, the parties and movements which are supported by him, uh, will probably gain power in Mali. So there is a possibility that uh, Mali in the future, uh, well, actually we don't know when, because the, the members of, of Junta first announced that they need nine months to organize the elections. Then there were discussions that uh, that they they could even need uh, three years. So, mm, yeah, uh, yeah, well, the, the, the periods are different. Uh, anyway, uh, nevertheless, uh, I guess that uh, uh, regardless the fact that he's officially withdrawing from political life, uh, Mahmoud Dika will uh, nevertheless uh, still stay as a very important, I would even say that a key figure of uh, Malian politics uh, or metapolitics as well. And what is what is interesting when you when you say that he has a very clear and open anti-French agenda? Because this is interesting when we look at Mali geopolitically. Um, since uh, its uh, independence from from France, from France's French colony, that um, Mali always kept the good contact to Paris, or had to keep. I don't know how to express it in the correct way. Had to keep the good contact to Paris, while at the same time also having socialist governments during the Cold War and approaching, for example, the Eastern Bloc and Soviet Union. Um, don't you think this will go on like this now, that also uh, with the new government, that they, for many, many reasons, that they can simply not cut with France right now? I mean, you, you, you said already one of the reasons it is that the state, uh, the state gold or parts of the state gold are, are, are kept in France. So um, how do you maybe not predict, but how do you expect the development there now after the putsch when it comes to the relationship to France? Well, uh, uh, one of the reasons of uh, huge criticism of uh, Ibrahim Boubaha Keita, the former president, was uh, uh, the presence of uh, a French uh, military contingent in uh, Mali. It's around, I mean, officially it's uh, around 5,000 uh, French soldiers there, uh, plus some um, soldiers from different European Union countries, as uh, as you told me, there are even some German soldiers. Yes, also. yes, more than 1,000 German soldiers are also present yeah. in Mali yeah. peace mission. Yeah. So uh, uh, then, then we should ask what is the reason of their presence there, yes? Uh, and uh, just to remind some of our listeners, there was a very, uh, 
very interesting uh, event and situations in and situation in 2011 2013 so uh, nine uh, seven years ago there was a there was a, a situation that uh, we had a separate state in the northern part of Mali, a state proclaimed by the Tuaregs. Yes, you remember yes. Uh, the, the, the state. Even they had a name for the state. It was called Republic of Azawad. Yeah, so and it was uh, it was bigger. It was bigger than than the rest of Mali, right? Is yes, it, territorially, yeah. of course, because, yeah. but, but it was the desert. It was the of desert, course, of course, yeah. the desert part of the country, and. Uh, uh, why uh, why have the Tuaregs appear there? Because uh, for the very simple reason, I mean, um, because uh, most of those uh, very well trained and equipped uh, Tuaregs came after the um, uh, fall of uh, Gaddafi in the neighboring Libya. Yes. Yep. So the destabilization of Libya uh, actually caused the Malian crisis uh, for several years and decades, uh, even decades. Uh, Mali was kept relatively calm and quiet, uh, thanks to Colonel Gaddafi. I mean, Colonel Gaddafi was uh, simply uh, funding this one of the poorest countries of uh, Africa, of African continent. Yes, yeah. he was giving his financial support all the time. Uh, well, as 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 you remember, he had the whole idea of Pan-Africanism and uh, uh, supporting. Uh, his poor neighbors had also some ideological background behind. Nevertheless, it was also quite realistic from his point of view because, uh, well, he tried just to, to, to uh, keep uh, more or less stabilized the situation in the neighboring countries for the sake of Libya and for Libyan interests. Uh, anyway, uh, when uh, after the fall of uh, Gaddafi, after the, the uh, organized aggression of NATO against Libya, in uh, 2011, the Tuaregs went southwards. So they went to their homeland in uh, northern Mali. And they simply, I mean, uh, as far as I remember back then, in 2011, 2012, the Malian army, the official army, as soon as they have just heard that the Tuaregs are coming from Libya, they have just left their posts, their military bases, and <laughs> went south, yes, because they knew that the Tuaregs were, well, one of uh, most respected powers there, yes, uh, and, and, uh, and military forces. Uh, nevertheless, uh, so there was a period of Azawad, uh, which uh, actually Azawad was uh, um, attacked by by uh, the West, of course, it, it was perceived as a force destabilizing. To, uh, to, 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 together with Al Qaeda, we have we have also to say, because as far as I know, later on, uh, Islamists uh, were well, maybe not taking power, but became very influential there. Uh, exactly. Well, yeah. uh, some some experts claim that uh, uh, the West used uh, Al Qaeda or even uh, ISIS. Uh, to destroy Azawad as a, as a mm. republic, as a two republic, yes. So, so the, actually, same, yes. the same model as we find it, as we found it in uh, Kosovo with the Ucheka, as we found find it in um, Syria, in Libya, yeah. That uh, yes, 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 uh, that exactly. Islamists, militant Islamists, are the the ground troops uh, for for Western exactly, intervention. Exactly. Yes. So, uh, so they have uh, practically destroyed the, the Azawad as a new project uh, of Tuaregs, and uh, and well, and uh, of course the civil war has started. Yes, so uh, the guys, uh, as it's also in other parts of the world. Yes, after doing their job, the Islamists uh, didn't withdraw uh, back somewhere to, to 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 other countries. Let's say. But they uh, tried to establish their power in the northern part of Mali, yes. And uh, that was the reason, uh, the, the official reason for the West to intervene, uh, mainly the French. Uh, nevertheless, the situation hasn't stabilized. So we have uh, already a um, Western military mission there operating for seven years, uh, till uh, 2013, actually. A mission which uh, was actually invited by by a former president, uh, Ibrahim Bubakar Keita, who came to power in 2012. 
and which seems to be completely, totally ineffective. I mean, uh, there is still uh, a terrorist uh, threat in Mali, very high. There is still a destabilized and practically uncontrolled uh, northern part of the country. And uh, that was also one of the reasons to uh, to say goodbye to, to, to by, by the military, by the Malian mili military, to uh, to the former president and, and his people there. Yes, that was one of the arguments that, well, the French are here for seven years, but uh, they did practically nothing to stabilize the situation. Uh, on the contrary, they are, I mean, it was one of the accusations against the French. They are just, uh, you know, guarding the... Uh, possibilities and uh, the commercial potential of those French companies which are using mineral resources from uh, Mali, practically uh, getting them free there, yes? Yeah. I mean, uh, mostly uranium, because uranium is one of, of, the, of the most important, uh, most important Malian resources, natural resources there. Uh, so, uh, well, the, the, the outrage was uh, quite obvious. And uh, coming back to your question about uh, the uh, further developments of, of uh, uh, their attitude uh, towards France, France, I guess that at least uh, on the rhetorical level, uh, at least for, for the first period of uh, mm, uh, being in power, the military, the colonels will have to be more or less anti-French. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because uh, because of the social demand of the public demand for that, and because of uh, also uh, Mahmoud Diko, the Imam Mahmoud Diko, who who is vehemently anti-French, yes. So uh, at least uh, officially, I think uh, there will be quite a lot of anti-French anti-French rhetoric there. Uh, when it comes to the deeds, well, I don't know. Per, I guess that they will be more more or less pragmatic and uh, they, that they won't come into a, a straight conflict with uh, France and French interests there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you have also other geopolitical players in this part of Africa. I mean, you have, uh, uh, of course, uh, Turkey. Yeah. And there are some spe speculations that Turkey will also play, uh, try to, to play a, an important role there. Uh, supporting some, uh, as it as it does in 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 all other countries, uh, supporting some uh, Islamist groups like like the Muslim Brotherhood or a local branch of Muslim Brotherhood there, uh, which also might be used by uh, by the Turks uh, to control the situation. Uh, you have also, well, uh, some bigger players like the global superpowers. On the one hand, you have the United States. It's very quite, uh, I mean, uh, when it comes to the putsch itself, yes. And uh, the discussions about, about that, it's quite interesting that uh, the uh, American experts have blamed, uh, of course, as, as usual, it's a tradition, of course, uh, have blamed Russia for interfering in Mali. <laughs> uh, yes, 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 really. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they, ha they have claimed that uh, uh, the colonels uh, we are talking about, Mm -hmm. who took power there, uh, got some training in Moscow and traveled to Moscow several times. On the other hand, we know that uh, officially, it's an official information that uh, Colonel uh, Asimi Goita, uh, the, the main guy there in, uh, in the committee of, uh, of the colonels, uh, was trained by the U.S. Army. So the situation is uh, uh, quite unclear. I mean, it, a little bit reminds me the discussions about uh, Libya and uh, who is behind uh, yes. Khalifa Haftar, yes? Yes. Who also used... Who, who, was, who was trained to, in the U.S. To, to be in the U.S., yes. yes but, exactly. But who, who got uh, Russian support. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, nevertheless, uh, the situation seems to be quite uh, interesting and complex. Uh, and then you have China, yes, and the Chinese investments yeah. there. Uh, on the other hand, the Chinese uh, will probably just... Uh, Support all means of stabilization. Yes, as of course, they for their business would. interests. Yes, of yes, course. yes. They, they, yeah. they, they, are, they are focused on business, not on politics. So uh, the situation is quite complex. Uh, but uh, in Mali, we can just uh, uh, observe and analyze some uh, important trends uh, 
concerning inner politics, uh, the political systems, as well as the geopolitical rivalry in uh, whole Africa. That's why I, I guess and I think that's quite interesting to to watch what is what is going on there. Very last question. When it when we talk about geopolitics, the you mentioned already the idea of pan-Africanism, which was an idea strongly supported, especially in the in the last years of uh, Colonel Gaddafi, and also in Mali, um, there is a kind of pan-African movement, as in as in all African countries. Um, is this put somehow also backed? by the Pan-African ideology or by the Pan-African um, uh, movements. And what what does it mean? It seems right now that the Pan-African idea doesn't play such a big role as it used to play many years ago uh, when Gaddafi was in charge to do that. Um, is there any change to expect? Well, the Pan-African movement, I don't think, uh, I don't think so because... Uh, Uh, well, the Pan-African movement, as you uh, as you said, it was uh, uh, led by a charismatic leader, actually, Colonel Gaddafi. For the moment being, you don't have any uh, political leaders in in Africa, in the whole African continent, who would be who would be first so charismatic as Gaddafi was uh, for for the whole continent, and who would second have uh, uh, such uh, resources and uh, financial potential. Uh, to inspire and to, to, to uh, let's say, uh, develop a continental political movement, yes? I mean, uh, there is, of course, African Union there uh, as, an, as an international organization. Actually, African Union has uh, condemned the putsch as well as uh, another um, uh, integration structure there, which is uh, ECOWAS, a group of countries from the western uh, part of Africa, an economic community of, of Western Africa. Uh, so uh, I don't think that uh, that it is uh, possible for for Mali, for Malians to to become a kind of inspiration for a new wave of Pan Africanism. Uh, well, the only possibility for them to become become such an inspiration would be. If they would proclaim someone, uh, uh, let's say, uh, like uh, Mahmoud Diko, mm -hmm. their official leader, yes, but Mahmoud Diko withdrew from politics. Yeah. yeah? Uh, such guys, uh, I mean, charismatic leaders like uh, Diko would uh, have some potential, well, maybe not for the whole African continent, maybe not uh, on a such huge scale as it was in the case of Gaddafi, but. Uh, at least for the western part of Africa or for another former French colonies there. Uh, but on the other hand, um, remember that Mali is one of the poorest African countries, yes? So uh, it cannot inspire a continental integration because it, its potential is too small, I guess. Yeah, that was a uh, very deep and interesting insight. And I think, uh, in, again, in, it's, it's exactly like with the topic of Belorussia. I think uh, for our listeners, this was uh, more informative than watching 10 hours nonstop documentaries uh, on CNN. I would, I would say, um, we will keep an eye on Africa and and what is going on there, since everything, and that is, I think, very important for the European audience. Everything happening in Africa has consequences also for Europe. Um, as a last word, how do you see the? Well, not in short term. In short term, the answer would be clear, but in long term, the chances for a stabilization in Africa would, would mean two things. Uh, first one would be, of course, the uh, migration waves from Africa to Europe would uh, become smaller or maybe would even stop or maybe, <laughs> maybe even that people would uh, return. A lot of African leaders, also some charismatic African leaders, are calling uh, their African brothers and sisters from Europe to, to return to the African continent, to, to build up their, the society, the industry, economy, the state, the state structures. Um, and, of course, the other consequence would also be um, 
in terms of, in terms of stability, uh, less terroristic danger for Europe because it came, would come automatically with the disappearance of, uh, radical Islamist armed groups, which are easily jumping from Africa also to Europe. How do you see these chances in long term? Well, uh, <clears throat> the answer is quite uh, simple in my opinion. Uh, there will be some chances for that if uh, foreign superpowers uh, will not interfere into Africa, yes? Mm. For the moment being, Africa is uh, on the one hand used as a, as a territory of uh, post-colonialism or uh, neo-colonialism as in case of France and, and the western part of Africa. And on the other hand, it's uh, also used and abused by uh, global superpowers like uh, United States. Uh, you perfectly know that uh, uh, it's their geopolitical goal and aim to destabilize, for instance, the northern part of Africa. Well, uh, also also the, the Sahel countries like Mali. Yes. Uh, just to weaken Europe, yes? So this yep. is actually, you have perfectly mm, noticed that... Uh, uh, this is a threat for Europe. Every every single um, kind of destabilization of any African country is a threat for for European uh, for European uh, security and uh, for a, well a destabilization in Europe as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, of course, uh, if you look at Mali, yes, if. Uh, Mm, we might wish something to the Malians, but also to, to, to the Europeans, for the Europeans. Then uh, we should wish them uh, uh, stability and, uh, well, at least uh, uh, being more or less independent economically, uh, which could, uh, well, uh, prevent masses of migrants, which will probably in case of crisis, the, of deepening of the crisis in Mali, we should probably try to get to Europe. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they are now more or less able to do that because of the situation in Libya and because yeah. of the government in Tripoli, which, uh, which could uh, blackmail uh, Europe mm -hmm. as well as Turkey blackmails Europe with uh, another wave of immigrants, this time from Mali. Yes? So, yeah, yeah. so we, we, we should really all... Uh, wish the Malians to, to and, and the colonels as well, yes, to, to stabilize the situation. So we send our regards to the colonels of, La, uh, of Mali. Exactly. To, uh, <laughs> exactly, sorry. Maybe we are now quoted in media. media. You saw, by the way, that uh, uh, our podcast became more popular. I, I, I sent you uh, the, the Twitter stuff. It was from some weird uh, NATO NGO uh, from Poland. You saw that? Yes, of course. We really appreciate that they are listening to us, and uh, uh, perhaps they will learn something from our from our podcast. I think they have a lot of space to learn, uh, as it seems. Definitely, and we <laughs> and we of course uh, invi invite them for a uh, let's say professional discussion on, on different issues because they don't understand. They seem not to understand basic notions when it comes to politics and geopolitics. We are ready. We will do that. Of course. Ready it was, and front. It was, again, a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, next time, I think, might be very soon because we will have maybe um, today or tomorrow uh, some destabilization in, in Germany. And we might talk about this already in two or three days. Definitely, yes, and uh, you are the best expert uh, on Germany, and as a German patriot, we'll uh, have the floor here. I can. For our listeners, I know about Germany almost as much as Mateusz knows about Mali. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, and Bye. see you soon. Bye. This program was presented to you by Manuel Oxenreiter and Mateusz Piskorski. The hardest dissident who won't violate any time the global rules against racism, extremism, or any other bad isms.